Every holiday season, it's the same thing. My kids want the latest Instaphone, the cool new Playbox with Kung Fu grip, and a dozen other things I could barely pronounce or f***ing afford. It's enough to make you crazy. Well, not anymore. Why spend a fortune on consumer electronics when you could subscribe to Grover.com and get the latest gear and gadgets for a fraction of the price? Grover is a subscription service that allows you to rent consumer electronics flexibly for a low monthly price. Grover offers phones, drones, laptops, gaming equipment, cameras, and more. And the best part is, Grover has your back covering up to 90% of the repair and damage costs of the device. It's like Netflix or Spotify, but for electronics and subscribing is really f***ing easy. So go to grover.com slash mea culpa. First, browse and search for the tech you want. Second, select how many months you'd like to rent. And finally, Grover offers one, three, six, or 12 month subscription plans. Place an order and make your first monthly payment. It's just that f***ing easy. Do you like Apple, folks? Well, how do you like these apples? Grover's prices are f***ing insane. iPhones starting at $44, MacBooks for under 50, a Nintendo for less than $15 a month, or AirPods for $12.90, smart speakers for $7, so you can listen to my show in every room of your house. With Grover, you can subscribe to hundreds of products from your favorite brands like Apple, Samsung, Bose, Dell, Razer, Garmin, and many others by visiting grover.com slash mea culpa. Grover's circular model contributes to the reduction of e-waste by reusing their electronics across multiple life cycles. And there's a big deal, folks, so don't be a schmuck. Only a Trump would pay full price for consumer electronics when all you need to do is subscribe and save serious money. So sign up for Grover right now and get 10% off each month you rent on any item in the store. That's 10% off when you use promo code Mea Culpa at checkout. That's Grover.com slash Mea Culpa. Grover.com slash Mea Culpa. Go there now. This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the best of Mea Culpa. I hope you are enjoying a well-deserved break from the chaos of this past year and have some downtime over the holidays. While you're sitting on the beach or working in your garage, take some time to catch up on old episodes of Mea Culpa. You'll be amazed at how much has stayed exactly the same. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here with all new episodes starting on January 6th. Yeah, it's January 6th. Can you believe it? So without further ado, please enjoy this encore presentation of our January 8th, 2021 interview with actor Ben Stiller. This is my mayor. Yesterday, the President of the United States incited an armed insurrection against America. The gleeful desecration of the U.S. Capitol, which is the temple of our our American democracy, and the violence targeting Congress are horrors that will forever stain our nation's history, instigated by the President of the United States. That's why it's such a stain. In calling for this seditious act, the President has committed an unspeakable assault on our nation and our people. I join the Senate Democratic leader in calling on the Vice President to remove this President by immediately invoking the 25th Amendment. If the Vice President and the Cabinet do not act, the Congress may be prepared to move forward with impeachment. That is the overwhelming sentiment of my caucus. This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the Mea Culpa Week in Review. For those who find themselves dismayed at the stunning level of sedition, lies, and corruption spewing forth from the White House, this week might just go down in history as the nadir of our populist experiment with Donald J. Trump. This is the end result of Trump's own angry and divisive rhetoric, on par with what I warned would happen at my House Oversight Committee hearing. 
The fuse had been lit long ago, and after a final angry speech littered with lies and baseless conspiracy, the President's Revolutionary Guard of unhinged MAGA supporters descended upon our capital. This wasn't a protest. It was an armed insurrection done at the behest of the President. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. All week long leading up to the January 6th violence, Trump was urging his MAGA followers to come to Washington to make a stand. So, while Congress met to certify President-elect Joe Biden's electoral college victory, thousands of supporters of President Trump convened in front of the White House to call for the overturning of the 2020 election results. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. Speakers, including the president and his idiot adult sons, called on Congress and Vice President Mike Pence to stop the steal in a series of really angry speeches which served to incite his MAGA army towards violence. And it should be a message to all the Republicans who have not been willing to actually fight. The people who did nothing to stop this deal. This gathering should send a message to them. This isn't their Republican Party anymore. This is Donald Trump's Republican Party. We will never give up. We will never concede, Trump said during his Wednesday speech, before demanding that Mike Pence unlawfully reject the Electoral College results. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to certify, and we become president. And we want to be so nice. We want to be so respectful of everybody, including bad people. And we're going to have to fight much harder and Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. And now a quick recap of the madness. It's the storming of the Capitol. Trump supporters forcing their way into the halls of Congress. The remarkable scenes unfolding on live TV. I can see at least half a dozen protesters scaling, literally climbing the walls of the Capitol to get up to where their fellow protesters are. They broke the glass in the United States Capitol and now they are climbing through the window. Stunned TV anchors can't believe what they're seeing. It is an absolutely shameful, disgusting situation that we are witnessing here. Oh uh, my gosh, 24. Uh, it looked like a woman, um, very gravely injured, covered in blood. Still, despite the violence and tumult of the day, Congress was back in session just hours later to certify the Electoral College vote for Joe Biden. The proceedings, though, took on a profoundly different tone, with some Republican lawmakers looking deeply shaken. Now we gather due to a selfish man's injured pride and the outrage of supporters who he has deliberately misinformed for the past two months and stirred to action this very morning. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. Those who choose to continue to support his dangerous gambit by objecting to the results of a legitimate democratic election will forever be seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack against our democracy. That Donald Trump presents a clear and present danger to this nation should be obvious to just about everyone now. He has shown that he knows no limits to the depths he'll sink to in order to stay in power. Today's Capitol riot was meant to scare those that oppose him, to say he is capable of unleashing his MAGA army at will, to intimidate even Congress and frighten the liberal elite. President Trump has abandoned his post. He does not deserve to be president any longer. And he poses a real and present threat 
to the future of our democracy. He has become a presidential golem, a monster of our own creation, who we are now powerless to stop from wreaking further havoc. Luckily, there are just two weeks left before we rid ourselves of Donald J. Trump. The MAGA invasion of our nation's capital was a last ditch act from a desperate camp facing the end of its reign. I will tell you, Jake, I talked to a source, a GOP source close to the president who speaks with him regularly, and I, I take no pleasure in reporting this, uh, but this source tells me that he believes the president is out of his mind. Uh, the quote used by this uh, source uh, is he is out of his mind. And the source said the president is so traumatized by his loss in the election. It is all he can talk about. It is all he can think about. It, it, it's all consuming for him. And that in this uh, source's opinion, he is out of his mind. The fact that I predicted this very moment on this show gives me no satisfaction. i much rather have been wrong than watch the sickening display unfold before me. It was a festival of violence where stroller pushing MAGA moms clad in Confederate garb marched arm in arm with Revolutionary War soldiers and a host of armed fanatics. A San Diego woman was killed during the chaos that erupted inside the Capitol today. ABC 10 News reporter Laura Acevedo is in Ocean Beach where Ashley Babbitt's family was officially notified of her passing a short time ago. They were angry and aggrieved, but also joyous about being angry together in such large numbers. It was nihilism on a grand scale where MAGA brethren joined together to watch the world burn. Before the event, websites and social media platforms popular with MAGA followers lit up with frightening death threats from extremists who were vowing to start killing people after the event if Congress refused to make Trump president. On Monday, Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio was arrested while carrying a high-capacity magazine for his guns. A judge has banned Proud Boys leader Henry Enrique Tarrio from Washington, D.C. This after Tarrio was arrested earlier this week. He faces weapons charges and destruction of property. Tarrio admitted to taking down and burning a Black Lives Matter flag at D.C. church last month. But he says he burnt the flag out of love and not of hate. The crowd was ready for action, wanted to fight, and was looking for any excuse to do so. And Donald Trump gave them permission to do it. Then, like so many times in the past, he walked away from the Malay and washed his hands of any responsibility. In his followers' minds, it was 1776, and they were insurrectionists, bent on delivering the will of the people. Many had dreamt of this moment for years, even trained for it. Well, Juju, this really was a final stand for the president. You saw him address his supporters, making it clear that he will not concede. They wanted to take up that fight, so we saw thousands of them march right here to the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Calm and then chaos and violence. They stormed from all sides, smashing in windows, pushing past the Capitol guards to get inside of that Capitol, get to the Senate floor. Lawmakers were huddled under their desks outside we were hearing chants of fight for Trump. One woman tonight lost her life and we watched as she was wheeled out onto a stretcher gushing out blood from a wound that looked like it was appeared to be in her neck. We did not know her condition. Then Trump lit the fucking fuse and thousands of his most unhinged followers stormed the Capitol, occupying the halls of Congress and the Senate chamber. Voices could be heard on videos being live streamed from the building to hunt down Vice President Pence, who had already been secreted away to a secure location. Historians will note that the stunning display of insurrection was the first time the U.S. Capitol has been breached since the British attacked and burned the Capitol building during the War of 1812. Yet, the shocking scene was met with less police force than many of the Black Lives Matter protests that roiled the country in the wake of George Floyd's killing. While federal police attacked peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square outside the White House over the summer, clearing the way for Trump to take a photo in front of a nearby church at the time, protesters on Wednesday were able to overrun Capitol Police and infiltrate the country's legislative chambers. I want to be very clear. Those who perform these reprehensible acts cannot be called protesters. No, 
These were rioters and insurrectionists, goons and thugs, domestic terrorists. After repeated pressure from leaders on both sides of the aisle to call off his MAGA revolutionaries, the president finally released a video message on telling his supporters to go home. Yet, in the same video, he continued to push baseless, false claims about the election. I know you're in pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us, he said, repeating a false claim in a one-minute pre-recorded video. But you have to go home now. I know your pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. Yeah, I will not tolerate fake news no more. It is clear from what I know about Donald Trump that he is clearly enjoying himself. In these final days, he has brought the country to its knees and driven us towards armed insurrection on the steps of our capital. For someone who thrives on chaos, this moment, which he has nudged along for months, is the high watermark. In his mind, that he could foment such violence in his name makes him dizzy with fucking delight. Hi, Hoda. Good morning to you. This is a White House in chaos with, as you say, multiple officials resigning overnight. And now lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are rebuking President Trump for encouraging violence. NBC News has confirmed this morning there is even talk of invoking the 25th Amendment here within the administration to remove President Trump from office with fears there could be more unrest. Meanwhile, the president's children were in furious damage control, knowing that what their father had just wrought was destructive and criminal. Ivanka Trump deleted a tweet in which she labeled the rioters American patriots. Her brothers, who tweeted their own disavowals, had stood in front of the same mob earlier that day, riling them up and threatening lawmakers who didn't support their father. Has the whole world gone crazy? Am I the only one around here who gives a shit about the rules? Beyond Donald Trump, today's angriest man was most likely Mitch McConnell, who seemed genuinely outraged at Trump's MAGA coup, delivering some of the day's most forceful denunciations of the president. The United States Senate will not be intimidated. We will not be kept out of this chamber by thugs, mobs, or threats. We will not bow to lawlessness or intimidation. I feel no sympathy or appreciation for fucking McConnell, though. Simply doing the right thing and not supporting a presidential coup does not make you a hero, my friend. If he hadn't so cynically enabled the president for the entirety of this administration, we would not be in the position in the first place. Four years ago, McConnell made a deal with the devil to get his agenda passed by this rancid fucking monster. And we are paying the price for it daily. <laughs> Even before the MAGA mob set foot in the building on Wednesday afternoon, Donald Trump was floundering badly. First and foremost were the pair of Democratic victories in Tuesday's runoff election in Georgia. Tuesday's Georgia victory was a bright spot of hope in the midst of the maddening moment. With the election of Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, we are witnessing the beginning of the end for Donald Trump as a GOP kingmaker. His perceived power came from what people believed to be his iron grip upon the electorate. Oppose Donald Trump and you will feel the wrath of his MAGA army. Support the president, and you would glide upon his gilded coattails into the arms of angels. But this week, that all fucking ended. And now, for the main event. After the events of the past 24 hours, I thought it made sense to lighten things up a bit. Thus, we're happy to introduce our next guest on Mea Culpa. Yes, Ben Stiller. The actor, producer, writer, and director had the good fortune to play Michael Cohen on Saturday Night Live. And today, I get a chance to grill him on his process and what's involved in getting to the core of playing me. But beyond the obvious laughs, 
We also delve into Stiller's political fears and discuss the pathology of Donald Trump, which proved to be incredibly prescient in light of the political chaos we're witnessing. So let's go now to that conversation. Ben, I don't want to waste any time here because the listeners are obviously hot and excited in order to hear this conversation. So let's jump straight into this thing. As someone with a massive public platform, because I understand yours is about 5.7 million followers just on Twitter alone, the ability to amplify certain voices, news, and opinion, I'm sure you feel a sense of responsibility to get it right. How do you feel when you see others on, say, like the right, abusing these platforms and pushing out all of these conspiracy theories? Because some 70% of Republicans polled actually believe that the election was rigged. Now, misinformation is everywhere, and an entire right-wing ecosystem exists to amplify those lies. How do you think we begin to put the genie back in the so-called bottle when it comes to fake news? Because is it regulation of the platforms themselves, or does the left need as aggressive a media ecosystem as exists on the right? What's your thoughts? Oh, gosh. That's a heavy question, Michael. I mean, I first of all, I, I'm awful at Twitter. I am just bad at it. I uh, engage when sometimes when I get emotionally pulled in, sometimes I'll want to respond to something. And then I find if I wait like 10 seconds or a minute, sometimes the urge will go away, you know, but that that natural sort of response when you see somebody writing something that you know is false or something that you think is inflammatory. I mean, I, I think it's a, a, that human reaction. So I'm just really bad at it. I think what I, my own sort of like just view from as a person who's on it, not, you know, I don't know how, why I have 5.7 million people. I don't believe that actually. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they are or who they are. Um, somehow, you know, there's people, I don't, I, I, I never get into like the real demographics of Twitter. I don't know if you've gotten like deep into the demographics of like where the actual followers are for you and all that. No, I'm actually as bad at it as you are, but yeah. I don't have 5.7 million followers. Right. But also you, you know, you're a person who has something very specific that you're talking about because of, you know, what you've been through and what you've done and, and what you want to say. And, you know, for me, I'm kind of just like there sort of like a lot of times I'm just like scrolling through, like kill time, you know? And I think it's like really, you know, Twitter has become that thing that we go to when we want to procrastinate or, you know, uh, just, you know, in our day. So you know, sometimes it's entertainment. I'll look at it for news or whatever, but you know, we're all in our own echo chamber with Twitter, right? You only follow really the people that you're interested in following. So I think it's a very distorted view that you're getting, you know, either on the right or the left. I think when I start to dip into Twitter on the right, you know, it gets me so uh, really like upset sometimes when I see what people are writing that it takes me to a place where then I want to like write something that's, that's, you know, angry and responsive to that. And I don't think that's really helping anybody. So that's what I try to like take 30 seconds or a minute and really think about it. But I think everybody has ended up in their own echo chamber. And I think the left, you know, maybe it's not as, I don't know, you know, the, the reality of it, but I know that people are speaking a lot of the time to themselves. And when they cross over and you start to get into conversations sometimes with people, every once in a while, I will get into a conversation with somebody from the right. Um, you know, I usually try to end it in a way that's human or like try to feel like it's like becomes it becomes about connection and like people go, hey, I can appreciate that you have your point of view and I have my point of view. Right. But remember that many of the times that you start engaging in conversation, that's where the bots and the trolls are really located. What they do is they say something which is inflammatory that they know will certainly bother a certain group of individuals. And they hope that people, especially somebody like yourself who has the check mark next to his Twitter handle with 5.7 million followers, that you start to engage because that's their whole goal is to upset the ecosystem, to create a conversation where no conversation really existed. Yeah. And I think that, you know, honestly, this reminds me, I'm a big Star Trek fan. It, there's, yeah, a me Star too. Trek, there's a Star Trek episode where the Klingons and, and, the, and the crew of the Enterprise are, you know, are fighting each other constantly. And they're feeding this entity, this alien entity that just like is this like energy source that's hovering like this, like kind of light source that's in the corner of the room. And it gets brighter and brighter every time that they fight with each other. 
And I, I really feel like that's what's, what's going on. You know, like the, those bots and trolls, it's being fed, you know, the antipathy and the, and the divisiveness and, it, and it's being fed and it's, and it's feeding this sort of like this greater, I guess, you know, um, I don't like what, what is benefiting, uh, you know, is the social media platforms, I guess, are benefiting. And then the people who want to spread the disinformation are benefiting. Yeah, that they do. And who's perfect for it? But our orange crusted clown, right? Our idiot in chief with a hundred million followers. The president has just about a hundred million followers, but his big mistake and many people's mistake is just because you have a follower doesn't mean you have a supporter. I mean, there are people that go on Twitter because they don't like Ben Stiller. Yes. Right? That they, anytime that you say something, they want to say something nasty to you because that makes them feel good about themselves, assuming that they're even real because these bot farms are out of control right now. I mean, you could buy, as most of these celebrities will sometimes do, you know, they will buy a million, two million followers just to get the information out there so that they get the check and that it looks, it, it's really more about their ego than anything, and they're just not real. And then you have companies that control hundreds of thousands of bots, and next thing you know, especially like what happened with me when I was under attack, all of a sudden you start getting all of these Twitter followers attacking you one after the other, and they all say virtually the same thing. And of course, none of them have real pictures of their faces on it. It's always a cartoon or it's a cat or a dog or a banana, something stupid like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, in, in terms of just our everyday lives, how much this is really changing our actual lives. And I think the people who have the ability to ch to actually change our real life experience with Twitter are people like Trump, you know, who can say something and then that will motivate people to do things. And that to me is the scary thing. Yeah. And he knows that he can do it. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, like what some sort you know, celebrity might say about, you know, another movie or even what I might say about Trump, whatever, really doesn't really matter that much. But when they're, you know, there's somebody who's in a leadership position and who's spouting this divisive rhetoric. I mean, we're seeing the real life consequences of it. And that's what's upsetting to me. Yeah, and it just adds to the divisiveness that he that he causes each and every time that he opens up his mouth. I mean, I just say he he is legitimately one of the most ignorant and arrogant people that you can have. And to have him as a president when you're spewing these racist, these sexist, misogynistic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, homophobic, anti-Semitic rhetorics, right? There's a group that agrees with each and every one of those those hateful points. And it doesn't matter to him. And he kind of enjoys the chaos, which is, of course, why I hashtag him Captain Chaos. Yeah, and I, I really wonder what that is in, in reality with him, like how much he actually enjoys that and like what why he's doing it. I mean, I don't know if he's doing it just to sort of in the moment to sort of, you know, do something or if he actually has a plan with it. You know, that that's what I really wonder about, because it seems like he's taken it to such a level that at this point, it's, you know, it's literally like it's changed the, the experience of our lives right now. Yeah, Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> yeah. What were you saying? No, I, I'm saying I, I think, you know, that's probably the point for him, it seems to me. It's like is to have that, you know, to be relevant, to, to have that effect on people. So people are talking about him or thinking about him. Yeah, if they're not, he's unhappy. I mean, sometimes the way that you knew whether to go into his office about whether it was a bill that needed to be paid or a project that you wanted to get approved. The way that you knew was that you looked on the news, you looked in the newspaper and if he was on the front page of the paper, you knew it was going to be a good day. If he wasn't, you may want to reconsider waiting until the following day till he said something that was, let's just say, um, news or lack of newsworthy that they decide to put on the front page of the paper, then you knew that he was going to be in a good mood and it was a good time to go. Yeah, that's great. What a great way to live. Yeah. It's a, a, a hell of a decade to spend. <laughs> so, so Ben, let's now talk about you playing Michael Cohen because you played me on Saturday Night Live. Now, what aspect of my personality or my physicality was key for you in nailing what I have to acknowledge was a pretty accurate portrayal. 
Did you study tapes of me on my television appearances? You know, tell the audience how the great Ben Stiller became Michael Cohen. Well, first of all, the fact that you uh, that you give it your stamp of approval, I really that that makes me feel good. <laughs> well, I, mean, I do because uh, honestly, I don't know. Like you know, all I, first first thing I thought was I have such a thin skin that you know I always think, oh God, if there's somebody getting on Saturday Night Live and doing me, how would I deal with that? You know, and not very well. But I in the, you know in the moment when I got the call, and it was so much in the news at the time. You were so much in the news at the time. You know. For me, the first thing I thought was like, well, the guy is like, you know, he's in New York. Um, I saw this sort of interesting sort of um, dichotomy of the of fear and also like like a real like a like a like a killer, too. <laughs> so there was sort of like this combination, right, where there was like a sensitivity in there of a human being who's like it, like a deer in the headlights. That's what I felt like deer in the headlights when you were like having to go and testify, right? That incredible, you know, just like the spotlight on you. But then I saw inside this guy who's sort of basically like, like just like, I'm like a guy who's just like trying to, you know, kind of stand up for who I am. And so I was try, I, I felt like there was like a humanity in there that I was trying to connect with. That was like, I related to my own fear, my own fear of going on Saturday Night Live to play you. I tried to take and use, <laughs> as if what you were going through, having to go and like testify in front of Congress. Because you sort of got a lot of my, my physicalities. You got my motions down, you know, when they, when they started the episode and, you know, all of a sudden you're speaking to Trump on the phone about Stormy Daniels. I mean, honestly, I have to tell you, my own mother and father called me and said, did you know that Ben was doing this? I said, no, why? They said, because he really got you down packed. I thought maybe like you had worked with him, you know, on making sure that it was right. And, and I said, no, ma, the guy's an actor, right? <laughs> I mean, I just, I felt like, you know, you, there was a humanity there. And like, I just was thinking like, of you know, the situation that you were in was like this crazy situation. And, uh, and then actually we were doing it. Stormy Daniels also was there too. So there was like this weird sort of meta reality because she was like in one of the sketches too. But the original idea was an idea that the writers had in SNL that it was, um, you know, the, this meet the parents sort of parallel that Mueller, you know, De Niro was Mueller and uh, I was you. And I thought that was like a really funny idea. So it was really just sort of playing into that idea and then putting him on the lie detector, you know, seemed like it, like it really fit. Um, you but know, what's funny though, Ben, is that I would have expected that you remembered that we had met on several occasions, right? Especially the last time, I think we were at an art exhibit for maybe it was Peter Tooney and um, you were with your wife. I was with my wife and we were talking uh, because I had met your wife many times in the past. Um, she's best friends with one of my college roommate, Greg's wife's Jennifer. And right. um, we started talking about the children and we were talking about the various schools where my children were at and where your children were at. So I thought that maybe somewhere in there that you had remembered the meeting or that that's how you sort of got the mannerisms down. I, I don't know, but I can only tell you, you did a great job. Well, thank you, Mike. I, I blocked that out. I blocked that out because I think going to do it, I was probably like, I, you know, I, I think I, I really did not connect it. Cause I think I saw you just as this person in the news, you know, who, I, you know, it was like, it became, it's also the thing of like, I, what I thought about after when I was doing it, is like, this is a human being, this is a person, he's got kids, I want to try to like, do this in a way like, I don't want it to be like this scathing mean thing. Um, but it's also satire, you know what I mean? It's parody. And it's, and it's also like the world that also that I can't, you know, I can't imagine the world that you actually were in at that time, or the world with Trump, and how that, you know, goes how that went down on a daily basis. So like, I figured, this is just part of the whole experience that you're having is you can say, oh, yeah, and Ben Stiller is doing me on Saturday Night Live and just kind of like take it in stride. Yeah, but I'm shocked that I heard you say that you're thin skinned. I wouldn't think you to be thin skinned. I am. I am. I'm a, like a sensitive actor type. And, you know, I, I, I think the guy from the Big Bang Theory, one of the guys from the Big Bang Theory did an impression of me once. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's kind of funny, but I, you know, I'm just not, I'm not great at it, but I also feel like, you know, that's kind of, I mean, look, when you do movies or act, you, you know, you have to, you do it, you put it out there and then you have to figure out a way to kind of go forward and not kind of 
you know, some people are great at criticism or, you know, reading reviews. And I did that for a while. Then I decided to stop reading reviews because I figured it just didn't help my process at all. But you kind of just kind of like you have to do your thing and figure out your way forward. So I guess I guess the line from Dodgeball, nobody makes me drink my own blood. Right. Would probably <laughs> sum it up pretty damn good. <laughs> I think yeah, nobody makes me bleed my own blood. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also the other thing that was going on was I was thinking about you having to go to prison too. And I felt bad um, because I was also directing a, a limited series of, about uh, a prison escape at the time uh, at Clinton Correctional in upstate New York. So I was thinking, you know, I was spending time around prisons and I was also thinking at the time, like, oh, this is like what this guy is going to. And my worst fear in life is going to prison. That's like I literally have nightmares about it. I, you know, just in, in life. So then my recommendation is don't go. I actually never thought in my wildest, wildest imagination that I would ever, ever be a felon, that I would ever go to prison. And I have to be honest with you, um, the drive up when I was self-surrendering to Otisville was one of the most surreal moments that you could ever possibly imagine. You get there. You sign in, they take you, they strip you out, they give you basically one pair of the worst underwear you're ever going to wear. They always give you either a pair of pants that are two sizes too small or five sizes too big. That's just part of the hazing process. The shirt, the t-shirts are all torn and you know they're, they're just gross. The socks have holes in them. I mean, I it's say, really- Yeah, the too small pants would probably be the worst, right? That's what really makes you feel bad. The two sizes, two everything, small. everything yeah. makes you feel bad. And, you know, they give you a little roll and then you basically you have nothing, you know, in your life, no matter what station of economics that you exist in, you have something, you have a car, you have, you have a bed, you have a couch, right? You have a refrigerator, um, you have a pair of shoes, you have nothing. You have nothing. I mean, it is the most humbling experience. And you're staring, for the most part, at a six by six inch, poorly painted, white, faded, cylinder, concrete block. And you don't know any of the guys that are there. Um, and you just, you're lost because the sadness that fills your heart missing your wife, missing your children, your parents, you know, your friends, your life is just basically stripped from you. And then for me, it was even more difficult because every day in like the rec room, Trump's ugly fucking face is sitting there on a picture right next to, at the time, whoever the you know, Bill Barr and then the head of the Bureau of Prisons and then so on down the line. So you got to stare at that picture all the time. And every time that you turn on the television, that fucking asshole is on it and saying something stupid. And you're wondering, why am I here when what I did, I, I did at his direction and for his benefit? You know, so many of these people that we see that are being pardoned now, these people actually stole money from other people. They actually committed crimes. Yes, I acknowledged, right, campaign finance violation. But who gets 36 months? And then they're like, well, you know, you, you had a tax issue. There was no tax issue. That's bullshit, and I will prove that, you know, and especially my second book that I'm starting to work on goes after the prosecutors. It goes after the whole process. I'm a guy who has one speeding ticket in my whole entire life, 1985. I don't think I ever had a parking ticket, right? I don't drink alcohol. I don't do drugs. I, I've never filed a late tax return in my entire life, not once until 2017 when all this happened, right? When Trump paid $1,500 in taxes for the two years, I paid $3.1 million. And that's why I'm suing my accountant now. And it's funny, he screws up. And then he becomes a witness for the prosecutors to testify against me at a grand jury. I don't know that the whole mm. system is just really messed up. And that's why I filed this writ of mandamus, this writ of habeas corpus, because I, I, I will continue for the rest of my life to be active in prison reform until they get it right. And you had to also 
you got, they let you go home and then they sent you back. And I thought about you when that happened, that must've been really weird. Do you know why they sent me back? Why? You tell me. I don't, I, well, I think they were, they, weren't they saying that you, you weren't agreeing to sign the, whatever you had to agree to, to not do publicity? Right. Uh, it was exactly, it was the fact that I refused to waive my right to publish the book, Disloyal, my memoir, um, and they, which is basically a violation of my constitutional rights, and out of retaliation for that, they remanded me back to prison. But so many people believe, because the New York Post put it out there, right, which was a Rupert Murdoch paper, who was a, at the time was a big supporter of Trump, that because I was having dinner at a restaurant around the corner from my home, that I was in violation of my home confinement, which I was not. I wasn't on home confinement. I was on furlough and I was permitted to go to dinners and to reintegrate myself back into the community. That's the whole purpose of the furlough. So that's again, goes right back to the entire concept of the misinformation. But I do want to say, Ben, last week, you retweeted a post from the hilarious comedian and singer, Randy Rainbow, who actually did something about me as well, that read Pete Buttigieg will be the first gay member of Joe Biden's cabinet if you don't count me, which you fucking should. Now, it also goes on, you wrote, Secretary of Kick-Ass Entertainment and Satire, besides Randy Rainbow, who was high on your list at the moment for producing timely and effective political satire? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, on Twitter, I mean, I, I appreciate people like uh, Patton Oswalt and who I think is one of the funniest comedians out there, who's basically, you know, commenting on the insanity of everything. I think there's like certain comedians who are able to just vent and be funny at the same time. I find like when I want to vent, it's not funny. I'm just like, it just, it sounds like a frustrated guy who's like, anybody could be saying this. And it's like, yeah, duh. But if you can be funny and say it, you know, people like Patton, I think they're um, smart people. Like, you know, Sarah Silverman, I think is amazing. Um, in the, you know, in the, especially on Twitter, I think, you know, there's a, an ability to like kind of take an idea and then say, and, and find the funny angle on it. And also um, kind of like speak for what we're all feeling. So, you know, people like that, there's a guy named John Fuglesang. Do you know who he is? No, really I'm going to really now smart. follow him. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, and then there's, you know, Seth Meyers, I think is insanely amazing. You, you know, like every night, I mean, what he's been doing with a closer look to me, is, has been just like a, an amazing distillation of like of what is so fucked up about what's going on with with, with Trump right now. So, you know, uh, and Colbert too. Yeah, I did Seth Meyers. I had a great time with him yeah. uh, as soon as uh, I was released, which is, um, it was a lot of fun. And he's, he's a really, he's a funny guy. So I truly did enjoy that. I'm curious though, like having been in the, like the maelstrom and having been, you know, seeing yourself portrayed on SNL and, jokes being made and you know I, how did you sort of navigate that for yourself when uh, when all this was happening well it's funny when it's really not funny it's sad more uh, like it the very beginning when this all started happening was an overwhelming um sense of dread and grief and despair because you have the power of the government coming down on you like a force that you can't possibly imagine. And whether you play the role, you know, whether you try to study the role, you really can't because this process doesn't break your heart watching your children, watching your wife, watching your parents, you know, um, sad, the sadness. It doesn't just break your heart, it shreds your soul. And you just become sad beyond sad to the point where, and I talk about it in my book, Disloyal, while I was um, staying at a, you know, at a hotel, I went up to the roof and I actually just stood on top of the roof and I was just, I just wanted to jump off. And I, I just wanted to, you know, to end it because the pain, when you go, to, when you're awake, the pain is enormous. And it's even worse when you're sleeping because your subconscious just takes you to a whole nother level of grief and then you're saying to yourself why is this happening right i mean it's an nda for god's sakes 
and I've never not paid taxes in my whole life. If there's an error, no problem. Even, even the judge acknowledged that there's no economic loss to any individual or any institution ever. So what are they coming at me for? And but the do, you whole, feel, do you feel like you did something wrong, though? Well, I did do things wrong. I worked for a man that allowed me to take what I knew to be right and to do things that I knew were wrong, but I rationalized it. But even, even with, for example, the errors in the taxes, I paid them before sentencing. It's not as if it's not as if I took a dollar from you or from anybody. There was an error made by my accountant, Jeffrey Getzel, which who I'm suing right now. It's not like I hid money like Paul Manafort did in the Ukraine. I've never had an overseas bank account. I never had an overseas business. Every dollar that that I had earned was in either Capital One Bank or First Republic Bank. So nobody tax evades by putting money in the bank that's located at the base of the building that they live in. That's just pure stupidity. I mean, the only one who would be stupid to do something like that would be Trump, right? And I don't put myself on that level. So the, just what ultimately happens is you become numb. You know, Ben, it's a, it's a terrible feeling. And I'm numb to this day, which I think people maybe sometimes give me too much credit for that you're very strong and, you know, um, I don't know how you're getting through it and so on. Um, I think a lot of it is just you become numb. You know, um, there's no other way to describe it. But you, yeah, but you figure out a way to, like, uh, to, I guess, um, I guess you're saying you put up whatever sort of, like, armor you need to to go through life, but you also don't want to numb out to, you know, to who you are, right? To your feel, like, to your feel. I guess you, I guess you probably have, like, a pretty close circle of friends, too. And that's kind of like your core too, I'd imagine. I do. And my wife has been beyond, beyond a rock and my children as well, because, you know, um, had things, had we not had the loving relationship that we have, um, I, I probably, I wouldn't be here. I have to be honest with you. I wouldn't be here. I stayed alive for them. And now my job is to make amends, not just to them, but to the country for creating this Frankenstein's monster. And that's, that's why I do this. That's why I go on, you know, on television uh, in order to identify the sort of psychosis of this narcissistic sociopath so that people understand exactly who he is. And I think thanks to so many people, myself included, like Mary Trump, like Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, like Anthony Scaramucci, like, Amorosa, like so many people that actually really truly knew him, I do believe that we were able to persuade enough people that it flipped in terms of because the election was closer than what it really should be based upon all of the man's actions. That's my that's my belief. And I think that we did a good job in ensuring that an adult is now going to be in the White House. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing to me, like who votes for Trump and I know a lot of people who voted for Trump this second time around and, you know, people I know, you know, family, people, relatives, friends, uh, you know, we don't talk about it a lot, but the reality is that people, I think, dissociate the person from the, the choice as who they're going to vote for president. Somehow they dissociate it. It's still to this day. And that to me is the thing that I kind of have trouble getting over is how they can do that. But I also think you can't discount the fact that 70 plus million people voted for it. You can't discount 70 million people, right? Right. Uh, many of them uh, were voting because of their pocketbook, because he managed to convince the world that he only could be responsible for ensuring the stock market and that his yeah. people's 401ks are going to go up. And it's funny because despite the number of times I've seen on the CNNs, the MSNBCs, the ABCs, the NBCs, charts showing that actually Obama had a better um, economy than in the four years of Trump. People don't care because Trump is very much like Stalin, right? Where if you say something over and over and over again, that people start to believe it. And then they start to share it as if this is some new type of information to basically show how smart they are and they perpetuate this lie. That's, that's, Trump's, that's Trump's belief system. 
Yeah, and and the lack of having any conscience really about um, telling lies. Yeah, lie. <laughs> Right. Thirty five thousand lies in four years, six, eight a day, something like that. But, you know, going back to Saturday Night Live, because Jim Carrey recently retired his Joe Biden SNL character, electing not to move forward, playing the president in future episodes. Now, personally, while I don't know his reasoning for not wanting to continue, I can imagine that playing these characters can be enormously stressful in this divisive political moment, especially when neither Trump nor MAGA fanatics have a sense of humor. Has it become too dangerous in this environment of death threats and street violence to laugh at your own political opponents? Oh, gosh, I hope not. I mean, I don't think that's the reason. You know, I think um, just first of all, just doing the show, doing SNL is a stressful thing. And it's really hard because it's getting rewritten or sometimes written literally the day of the show. So a lot of the times that that sketch that you're doing is 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 changing up until I remember the one where I had the burner phones where, you know, that that one uh, that was literally being rewritten to like two minutes before we went on the air. Um, and we couldn't decide whether or not I was going to have like a bunch of phones in a bin or just like have one phone and things like that are so hard. Like for, for me, it's, you know, live performing is not what my is not my favorite thing to do. Um, there are people like I think like Will Ferrell or Kate McKinnon who are just brilliant at it, like and like who just shine in, in that environment. But it's really, really hard. So I think that's part of it. I don't think it's the fear. I mean, in terms of how people react and, uh, you know, and what the the real world reaction is to political satire. I think that, you know, there's a small sliver of people, the people who are, who will act out, you know, when they're being uh, instigated by social media, by, by, by Trump or whoever. But I don't think that's, you know, in any way a factor or should be a factor in terms of, you know, doing political satire, but it's, it's a weird, scary world right now because people, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen and people do do crazy things. And I, I think that to me is one of the most disturbing things about what's come out of the last four years is just the environment that we're living in and having to like constantly tell my kids, like, this isn't usually what it's like, you know, this isn't, the president doesn't usually say things like this. You know, he's supposed to be unifying. He's not supposed to be divisive. He, he's not supposed to say racist things, you know, uh, and to ha to, it's just like become a part of our lives now, you know, the reality of our lives. Yeah. And what's what's crazy is every divisive, every inaccurate statement was getting picked up by the press and it was getting promoted and it was getting, you know, um, just it, it was growing and it was just growing out of control. Like since you're a Star Trek fan, like a treble, right? It was right. like it starts with one and then it grows to, to 10,000. You know, for example, you brought up the burner phones, right? That is a lie. There, I don't have burner phones, right? I just don't have burner phones. And when the FBI came and they raided the hotel I was staying at at the Lowe's, um, when they raided my home and then my law office, in my home, they took like nine cell phones and they somehow must have told somebody in the press that there were a bunch of these cell phones and they called them burner phones. They were my children's old cell phones. There was one that was <laughs> that was going back. It was the palm, the one that you had to put batteries in in order to lift the antenna up. And that's a burner phone. What the hell are they talking about? So they leak it to the press. The press turns around they're like well it doesn't make a difference i got from a reliable source that it's a burner phone it's like an apple one cell phone right going back to the year of gimel right it didn't work it was shut off they belonged to my children right and now all of a sudden burner phones and again they promote and the press continue to promote these lies and it it really it does matter Truth is really important. And that's one of the things why I stood up before the House Oversight Committee and I said to the Honorable Elijah Cummings, you know, God rest his soul, right? I'm here to tell the truth. And I'm here to tell the truth because I do not believe that under a Trump administration that there will ever be a peaceful transfer of power if he loses. And that's 20 months ago. I called it because I know yeah. the man, unfortunately, too well. Yeah, you and you and Bill Maher, right? I mean, it it really. Where do you see this thing headed in the next uh, couple of weeks? By the way, so I wrote an uh, there was an article that quoted me where I turned around and I said that each and every day 
as the clock counts down, T minus 29, 28, 27, you're going to see Trump do more and more crazy and crazier and crazier things because he can't help himself. The need to his fragile ego requires that he be in the press every single day. And he doesn't believe that there's such thing as bad press. So everything that he thinks he's doing, making him appear to be stronger and defiant and so on. But inside, he's fucking petrified because he knows that the New York Attorney General, Tish James, is is right on his ass. And he knows that Cy Vance, right, is is also going after him criminally for tax evasion, misrepresentation to banks, to bank fraud, wire fraud, you know, just a whole plethora of um, charges. And that's only New York for right now. There's, there's what, 50 other states here and then two districts that may be looking at exactly the same thing, whether it's his clubs in California, right, or whether it's going to be one of the clubs in Virginia or in, you know, wherever, right, in North Carolina, wherever it's going to be, that's where they're going to find these violations. And you'll start to see attorney generals and DAs going after him and his children and Kushner, and they're going to go after the Trump organization. And that's his biggest fear, which is making him more and more erratic because he is actually losing his mind thinking about the repercussions of not, not so much about the incarceration because he doesn't believe that's going to happen but losing all of his money because that's his identity without being able to say, I'm worth $10 billion. I'm $10 billion, right? You know, I'm smart. I'm this, I'm that. Without having that, that ability to brag about that, he's just an empty shell. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I personally am ready to stop thinking about Donald Trump all the time. You know, that's yeah, what but that's not going to happen. Yeah. And think, that's not going to happen. Well, I, I know that he's, you know, people are going to the first of all, the Republican Party is going to have to figure out how they go forward. And they're, I feel like they're trying like I don't think the Republican Party wants not that I'm a political pundit, but I don't think I want they want to you know, have him uh, run again in 2024. And I think that uh, everybody kind of wants to move forward and, and actually just live their life. And no matter what he does, I think, you know, once he's out, in my opinion, uh, it changes, it just changes the tone of everything. Except for the fact that, as you stated earlier, 70 million people voted for him, right? So they, all you need is 20% of that, and you have yourself a real base. But, Ben, what yeah. do you think happens to the entire Trump resistance media ecosystem that has sprung up during his presidency? Do you see that, con um, that coalition of satirists sticking around for the Biden administration? And if so... What becomes of their mission? Is the new North start to take down Trumpism? Well, I think everybody's going to have to, this is what I was just saying, like everything's going to have to change when he's not president anymore. And it's going to be a lot less, no matter what, there's going to be a lot less attention on him all the time. And the, the cable news networks, both the right and the left have fed off of that. I mean, the reality is that, you know, the, the CNNs and the MSNBCs, they all, you know, they, the, the ratings go up all, you know, when they're talking about Trump. So that's going to change things. And uh, in terms of comedy, I think it's going to be tougher to find comedy out of Biden. There are, you know, obvious things that you can clue into, uh, you know, obviously regarding his age and things like that. But, you know, ultimately, I think people personally, like, I think people are looking to just exhale and not have this be on the front burner all the time. And, you know, it is a question, what's going to happen you know, what is what is Trumpism going to be after he's out of office? Um, it's I think what those pe the people who are following him, either they're going to see that what he's really about or they're going to find someone else who will, you know, will forward their agenda. But I think you're right. It's people's pocketbooks. I think people just want to be able to feel like they're being, you know, in some way uh, uh, listened to and that uh, and and the, the government cares about, you know, making their lives better. And I think that's not what his agenda is. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what evolves. But, you know, comedically, um, there'll be a little bit of a void for sure. But uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'd rather have a much more normal life. Yeah, well, remember that Trump's agenda when he first started, when we first started the campaign, and I don't mean the one in 2011, but the one in 2015, his words to me verbatim, verbatim, 
Michael, we need to make this the greatest political infomercial in the history of politics. He wasn't talking about wanting to be president to do good for the country. This was all this was all about increasing the value of the Trump brand. This was all about, you know, opening the opportunities for more front page, you know, headlines featuring Trump and the Trump organization to do deals all over the world. That's what it was. He never thought he was going to win. Forgetting about against the Clinton machine, he didn't think when you had 16 other Republican candidates that he had a chance. So when he wanted to make this into the greatest political infomercial, what did he do? He jumped on the whole Bertha movement because it was sucking the oxygen out of the room for all the other candidates. It's an amazing concept. Yeah, and I've always wondered how much he actually believes what he's talking about or what what he, what his ideology actually is, you know, because it doesn't seem like he has any real I mean, if you look back, obviously he was never um this right-wing Republican. So it's really it's you know, I'm curious like what he, what he actually believes. Well, he's not a right-wing Republican. He's not an independent and he's certainly not a Democrat. He doesn't believe in anything. That's the problem. Donald Trump is a popularist. So whatever the popularist view is, that's what Donald Trump is is jumping onto. And this whole notion of stacking the Supreme Court, you know, for the purpose of, you know, assisting in the evangelical belief of, you know, a right to life versus um, right to choice. You know, he has he doesn't believe he's not a right to lifer. He he believes in he believes in abortion. I mean, how many times we've had that conversation over the years? He doesn't care what you do. He really doesn't. But the popularist view for that evangelical group was one way. And so he decided to adopt it. I mean, that's just that's a dangerous it's a dangerous man who thinks like that because he doesn't think at all. You know, it's funny just to go back to one of again, one of my favorite movies, Dodgeball. Right. You remember in the scene where like Peter LaFleur says to you, hey, White, you know, you're a lot dumber than I thought. Right. You remember your response back there? You know, oh, I don't think I'm a lot dumber than you thought. I thought that I thought that I was once, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, right? That's Donald Trump, right? Everybody knows he's dumb, but he doesn't think that he's a lot dumber than you thought that I think that I thought that I was once, right? <laughs> that's Donald Trump. And that's dangerous when this guy is holding the nuclear codes to this country and basically has the, the he's got his hands in the economy of not just this country, but the world. Yeah. I mean, I also think it's just exposed that how much the system, the system overall supports someone who steps into that role. And, you know, that to me is the most disturbing thing is the enablers and how everybody around him, you know, save for the people who turned like yourself, but the, those around him to this day continue to support, to support it just because the voters are behind him and they're afraid of losing that base. And that's, you know, that's the most important thing. And the, you know, the uh, holding on to power, like it just exposed that so clearly that's, you know, what goes on in our country. Yeah. And it's sad. Now this has absolutely nothing to do with politics, yeah. Trump or Thank the you. election. But I do want to ask you about a tweet that you wrote on December 8th regarding the anniversary of John Lennon's death, because you wrote 40 years ago tonight, I was outside of the Dakota, my best friend and I in complete disbelief at what had happened. I got in trouble for staying out late. Still, one of the most defining moments of my life, sending love to everyone who's lost someone. Can you take me back to what you were doing that night when you heard that John Lennon was shot and how it did define your life moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, 15. And I was living on uh, 84th Street and Riverside Drive. And uh, I think I was watching TV and the special report came on the news. And uh, I was a big Beatles fan, a big John Lennon fan. Uh, my best friend, Jonathan Harris, lived in the first floor. I lived on the fifth floor. We were in a band together. Uh, I heard it on the news, went downstairs to the first floor to his door, knocked on his door, and we just you know, we walked over, walked down to 72nd Street and there were a bunch of people outside the Dakota and was, you know, probably, I don't know, a couple hours after it happened. And we stayed there probably till like three or four in the morning. And, you know, everybody was chanting, give peace a chance. And uh, I remember there was, 
the people like Channing give peace a chance and they were clapping. And at one point there, um, I initiated a double clap. And I remember the, and the crowd picked it up and I remember thinking, oh, I started the double clap. Um, and it was pretty, you know, it was like for a 15 year old, like it was just kind of overwhelming. I got interviewed by Meredith Vieira, who was a, a WABC TV reporter. Uh, like a man on the street interview. And I was devastated. I mean, he was, you know, he was a, an idol. And then a few days later, we went to Central Park and there was a moment of silence in the park. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, like one of those times when you just realize that uh, things happen in life that uh, that you can't control. Yeah. So, Ben, I guess now you're telling us that you were a trendsetter even back then at the age of 15. <laughs> I, was, I, me I remember feeling proud that I had initiated the double clap in the group. Yeah, they're very good. Well, that's the band, that's the band guy in you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I saw that you're a fan of James Austin Johnson's Trump impersonation, where he's talking about the movie Downhill and Julie, um, Julia Louise Dreyfus's performance. Now, he seemed to nail so many of the particular nuances and the ticks of Trump's speech. What in your mind is key to a good Trump impersonation? God, I mean, there's so many different ones that are, you know, kind of fascinating. I mean, have you seen uh, the guy who does Trump doing breaking down Scooby Doo, the Scooby Doo episodes? That no. Is, oh, it's it's kind of brilliant. I mean, I think it's whenever somebody will take uh, some silly idea and start talking about it in the way that he does. That you know is basically like his stream of consciousness that is, uh, you know, always comes back around to him. I can't break it down really, other than when I see a good one, it really makes me laugh. I think, you know, obviously Alec Baldwin started the trend of doing something that was just so stylized. I mean, that to me is like the stylization has to really be there, you know, like to really take an exaggerate, but that's any good impression. But I'm, I'm awful at breaking down like what makes something good or bad. Right, but Trump obviously has a lot of ticks, right? And a lot of tells which, Alec Baldwin seems to have mastered. I mean, the hand motions, the sort of look on the face when he puckers. I always describe it as a guy who was sucking on a lemon and you farted in his face. It's sort of that look, you know, <laughs> almost, almost like, almost like your Zoolander look. To right. be very honest with you, you know that he's at Trump is in Zoolander because we at the beginning of Zoolander we interviewed people coming into the VH1 Fashion Awards. So he's in the opening credits with Melania. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's funny. And I've seen the movie like a million times. I'm I'm shocked. But there's actually a great line in Zoolander that reminds me very much of Trump. And, you know, probably I would like to send him this on a card. Right. I'm going to retire, withdraw from public life and become a hermit crab. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you remember that? I mean, wouldn't we just like for him to retire, to withdraw from public life and become a hermit crab? Yeah. I think it's I think it's up to the media and us to stop paying attention. Honestly, yeah. you know, that's like that's in what these, in these movies, you know, I've always had this. I've dying to ask you this one question for so, so long in so many of these movies that you're in. It almost seems that there's a lot of ad lib that's going on in Zoolander. Did you ad lib a lot? And, and also in Dodgeball, did you ad lib a lot? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the rule of thumb is like you want to have something written that, you know, is that works. That's funny. And then have the ability to let things happen. So, you know, sometimes uh, in the moment, if something is, you know, going on, yeah, you always let it go. But someone like, you know, like, like Judd Apatow, you know, Judd has literally made it an art form of understanding how to improvise on camera. And he'll improvise literally like 20 minutes, a scene will go on 20, 30 minutes, he'll have the actors improvise, and then he'll edit it together and, you know, find the best moments. But I find like, having something written and then maybe something happens in the moment. A lot of those Zoolander lines were, you know, come the, the writing also comes out of improvising, you know, together or like Will Ferrell, you know, as we got to, like he's an insane improviser. So, you know, this many years later, sometimes it's hard to remember which, what was written and what wasn't, but usually it's a mix of stuff. What about the line? The one when you turn around and you say to LaFleur, it was, in in our gym, we have stockholders. In your gym, you don't even have, and then you pause and you go, uh, cup holders. Is that improvised? Because <laughs> I use that line all the time. <laughs> Ross and Thurber, who wrote and, and and directed the movie, I think wrote that line. And uh I don't remember I don't remember making that line up, but uh, you know, it's 
it's really, it's all like, you, you kind of like just want it to be loose enough that you can try stuff. And usually I find most actors when you're doing that kind of thing, if there's something funny that comes up, sometimes in the moment, it'll be great. You use it. And, you know, the, the, I think the, the key is just not having to have the pressure to have to come up with it. You know, too bad because I really was hoping that you were going to tell me you ad libbed it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because I really enjoyed it. Now, I do want to ask about something a little more serious than that, because you're someone who's deeply involved with Refugees International. Um, how have you seen the degradation of conditions under Trump's America First policies? And what do you foresee changing under a Biden administration? Right. Yeah, well, so I'm a goodwill ambassador for the UN Refugee Agency and have been for uh, maybe two years. And um, what's been really concerning, first of all, the U.S. has always supported the U.N. Refugee Agency and has always been um, a funder. And that really hasn't changed that much in the last few years. Um, the thing that's been really, really disconcerting is uh, under you know the Trump administration was that the resettlement numbers went down to basically zero. And the U.S. has always been a leader in that. Um, and has led the world in that in terms of, you know, being a place to provide asylum for people seeking refuge from persecution and war. So that to me was really just personally really disturbing to see, you know, let alone what's happening at the border um, and the other things going on with separations of families and, uh, and, and kids, which is just awful. But just on the, in the refugee front, I think it's uh, really, really important that the U.S. come back to raising the levels of, of resettlement for people in this country and really because it really sets the tone for the rest of the world. And right now there are about 80 million displaced people in the world, 80 million. And uh, most of those people are, are being displaced by war uh, and are going to the neighboring countries. Very, very few actually come to places like the US. You know, maybe like, I think it's maybe less than 1% of uh, refugees get resettled in a third country. So those numbers, you know, even when they're very small, are, they make a huge difference because they allow the neighboring countries, the countries that are receiving the overflow, they, they give them an outlet to be able to handle, uh, the, you know, the, the logistics are just incredible in terms of having to support people, provide education, clean uh, water and uh, food and, and shelter, especially now with COVID. I mean, it's just been such a tough time. So I'm hopeful that the new administration is going to bring those resettlement numbers back. And, you know, refugees have been nothing but a positive, have nothing but a positive impact on our country. And when you look at the communities that they've come to, our economy, they've contributed billions of dollars in taxes. So, you know, it's a it's a very, I feel, you know, very strongly because you go and you meet these people, I've gone to places, talk to them, talk to families. They're families like you and I, who, who you know, just want to kind of go forward in the world, want to be with their kids, want to provide a living and just, you know, live out their lives. And their lives are stopped short through no fault of their own. Just, you know, having nothing to do with them, a war happens and all of a sudden they have to leave, stop and leave and everything gets put on hold. So I'm hopeful that the US is gonna go back to uh, what it's done in the past in, in providing a place for um, people to seek uh, refuge from, uh, from war and persecution. Yeah, well, remember, I, I told you, you know, my father being a Holocaust survivor, you know, you talk about the the pictures of families being separated and, you know, um, thrown into not cages, but in those they were they were huts and buildings and stuff like that. Um, so it was that was really one yeah. of the things that was a defining moment for me. And when I said enough is enough, I mean, you know, it's one thing to be an asshole. It's just another thing to be this big of an asshole. And I, I, that's when I really felt I had to step away. Yeah, for me, the, the real world consequences of what the pres how the president can affect the lives of other people, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very real thing for, for hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, I think, um, you know, what's really important is to remember that these are just like people like you and I. I mean, that's like part of what I do with the refugee agency is just going and telling stories. And so the people can sort of see that these are, are not statistics and numbers, but they're just, they're, they're people like you and I, and they're not something to be feared. There's something, you know, really it's about human connection and, and, and welcoming people. And, uh, and that's what the unity thing is about and getting away from this divisive rhetoric and really, uh, you know, really, embracing the fact that we're all people, you know, regardless of uh, where we come from. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, though, what was your election night like? Did you watch the returns with other people or did you just need to watch it alone? Because I know folks on both sides, but this year was particularly nerve wracking 
And um, as it just went on and on and on and actually still continues to go on. Yeah. Um, I was uh, actually alone <laughs> um, and kind of uh, it was so stressful. I, I, I mean, I was really thinking like, gosh, I don't know. For me personally, I was thinking like, how am I going to because I remember four years ago being pretty shocked uh, when Trump won. Um, and the sort of like, I was, I was working on a movie and the next day going into work and, and everybody was like, wow, that, that really happened. So this time I was thinking like, gosh, what would really happen the next four years? Cause I really did feel like the way that, uh, the, the institutions have been being eaten away at and, uh, and you know, what would happen without any, uh, need to get reelected on, you know, another four years just was a really scary thought to me, um, where we would go just in, in terms of the dialogue in the country too, and just how much, uh, anger there was out there. So I was alone. Um, uh, my daughter was in the city uh, with my wife too. And I was out, out of the city and I sort of just uh, was like glued, glued to the set and, um, and then up late, up late. And then, you know, a friend of mine who's a newscaster said, it's not going to be election day. It's going to be election month. And he was right. Yeah, I've heard that saying. Yeah, he is right. And I got to ask you this question. You recently auctioned yourself off for charity offering a 30 minute zoom um, that I believe went for like $1,675. But my sources tell me that you were in the same group as Greg Gutfeld, you know, the jokester from Fox and friends who actually, you know, and they say went for more than you. Do you know how much more he went for in the auction? And do you find yourself getting competitive during these things and constantly checking your price until it's over? I made the mistake of checking once. And then after that, I was like, I can't do this. It's just talk about, you know, like look at, looking at self-worth. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think uh, it, it makes sense that the Fox guy would go for a lot more. Cause like, you know, he's a talker. That's what he does. Like he's, you know, I think that's his, that's his thing. It actually was, it was for homes for our troops, which is Jake Tapper's charity. And I thought it was great that the Fox and friends guy was doing it you know, for like just sort of crossing the divide a little bit, you know, um, and more power to him. So I'm, I'm glad that he raised as much money as he did. I I don't claim to be the most entertaining individual to have a Zoom with, so I wouldn't put a price on myself. Um, I would, for, I will try to make every minute of that 30 minutes though worth the, whatever the per minute number would be on that. And then right. some. You know, you know, I'm not buying that bullshit for a half second. <laughs> you don't care. You can say whatever you want to me. I'm not buying it. But I'll tell you, if I was your fixer, like I was for Trump, when that was there was going to be an auction for paintings, and there was yeah. one of him, I had a straw bidder come in, right? And I had it bid up to a hundred thousand dollars when everybody else's at most was a thousand. All huh. of a sudden, it's no name artist, right? Decides to paint a picture of Trump. His fragile fucking ego would not allow somebody else to beat him out in terms of a price. So he re he then has me reach out to a mutual friend, a straw buyer, and just to bid it up to a hundred grand, right? But right off the rip, it wasn't even like, okay, 10,000, oh, 15, 20, right? Like if you're watching Storage Wars, nothing like that. The guy just comes out and says, I'll pay a hundred thousand dollars for it. Right? And what, what happened? How do you get the guy to do that? You just tell him it has to happen and you pay him? Yeah, and I told him I'll reimburse him the money. The funniest thing is after he did it, we had a little bit of a difficult time getting the money out of Trump because <laughs> Trump doesn't see it that way. You know, oh, you know, well, yeah, you're going to give me the painting, right? I mean, you don't want to keep a six foot by four foot painting of my head, do you? So the guy's like, no. So he, we, he was expecting the money back. And he turned around and he said, listen, I'm not joking. And that's when Trump used the foundation the Donald J. Trump Foundation to pay him the money back. And that, of course, is one of the reasons why the foundation ultimately closed. Because the foundation, despite what Trump thinks, is not slush fund money. It, it has to be operated like a foundation for a charitable purpose. And buying a painting of yourself for your fragile ego is not a charitable purpose. And where is the painting now? That's the question. It's up on the, six, it's up on the 26th floor in his private conference room. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Look down on it. That, <laughs> it's looking nothing at the room is like a storage facility. But, you know, Ben, as I've taken up a lot of your time and we're approaching our hour time here, I'm going to hit you with one final question here. As a fan of 70 cinema, there are so many great, I mean, really great political thrillers from that era. I'm curious, 
If you were to create a syllabus of political films for paranoid political times, what would make your list? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, like probably like the, the number one movie, you know, in terms of that would be parallax view. Um, that's just like, you know, the Pakula movie. Um, just cause it's like the ultimate paranoid political thriller and just beautifully shot. And it's like Warren Beatty heyday and just amazing film, amazing, just visual film. Um, and I guess, you know, all the president's men is just continues to be to, for me, one of the classics, you know, um, there's probably a few more like the, um, the candidate, Robert Redford. Mm -hmm. I'd say that would be like those. I'd say those would probably be the top three. Um, uh -huh. But for me, I'm also like I'm just like sort of like a fan of '70s, you know, '70s crime movies overall, like French Connection, Dog Day Afternoon, Taking a Pelham One Two Three. Taking a Pelham One Two Three is probably my favorite '70s New York movie too. Yeah, what'd you think of the remake? Not bad, right? I did not really watched the remake because I love the first one. I, and by the way, I'm a Denzel Washington fan. I'm, you know, uh, I forget, was it, who, was it Tony Scott, I think, directed the remake? But um, but the original is just, my first of all, my dad's in the original. He plays Walter Matthau's sidekick. So I have, and it's like the first movie set that I was ever on. But I just think it's like, kind of like one of the coolest New York movies ever. You know, and how does Tropic Thunder fall into that one? I don't, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I, I love people. that movie too. Yeah. Was there a lot of ad libbing going on in Tropic Thunder too? Oh my God. Because that's yeah. some that's gotta be one of the funniest casts around. And talk about funny, right? Tom Cruise. How great was he? You know, Amazing. playing in a comedic role. Yeah, and also that that character was his idea too. When we were writing, talk about the imp improvisation. We had written the script. At one point I talked to him about uh playing uh my role, and then and then at one point I talked to him about playing the agent. And then he said, well, you don't have a studio executive. Why don't you have a studio executive in, in the movie and, and, you know, make fun of that. And that's where we came up. That's when we wrote that part, J Justin Thoreau. And I came up with that for, because it was Tom's idea. And then he <laughs> yeah, just, he's, he's you know, a great guy. Um, and I couldn't believe it. You know, Tom Cruise in a comedic role, because you really don't yeah. expect him, but he was great at it. Yeah, he's a, a, I mean, his level of movie making knowledge and commitment to movie making uh, is is something else. Ben, I don't know how to say thank you enough. Um, this has been great. Um, really, I wish you nothing but the best as we, you know, come into 2021. You know, like I said, T minus 28 and counting. And anything that you may need from me, uh, you know, obviously feel free to reach out. And you know where to reach me. Thanks, man. I'm happy to connect with you after having this journey of being you a few times and having that. I mean, that was my own experience. You had your own experience of being you, but I had my experience of being you, which was in, in like a much smaller level intense, you know, but it was really it's really been nice to connect with you after it. I'm glad you reached out. Thank you. Are you are they going to bring you back another SNL? Um, they're going to bring back all the, all that, the that's people? up to you, Michael. Depends what I'll you have do. to speak to Lauren. <laughs> well, it depends what you do in life. We'll see. Stay at, yeah. I hope not, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah you and me both. <laughs> With less than two weeks left in Donald Trump's terrible reign, he seems determined to do as much damage as possible on his way out of office. Today's terrible violence and his abject refusal to accept responsibility or vilify its participants is typical of Trump and has defined his presidency. But watching him cling with growing desperation to anyone or anything that will keep him in power, no matter how insane or fucking dangerous, has got me wondering what is out there beyond the protection of his executive privilege that has Trump so scared that he'll openly foment sedition and attack his own government. That he will continue to behave abysmally is without question. The better question is, what else is out there waiting for Donald Trump? It's likely prison, and I hope so. So let's hope that they make it stick. And thanks for listening. Mea Culpa is brought to you by Audio Up, Midas Touch, and LSJ Media. And it's written and produced by Jimmy Jelinek. Executive producers are Jared Gustat, Jimmy Jelinek, myself, Michael Cohen, and Phil Alberstadt. Our editor is Lisa Orkin. 
It may be a new day politically, but nowadays the landscape is more confusing than ever. Donald Trump may have lost the battle for the presidency, but in many ways, Trumpism is winning the war on the state and local level. Mea culpa is here to help guide you through the wilderness and keep you informed. And let's face it, we all want Trump, Rudy, and the rest of these seditious traitors to see justice. And folks, it's coming. So stay tuned as I guide you through the twists and turns of the criminal process that will ultimately see them behind bars. Mea culpa, nothing but the truth. This is my mea culpa.